Dr. Jimmy Renault from, um, he's that not a NSF postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. And he is going to talk to us about, his talk is titled, Towards the Identification of Host Receptors in Hookworm. And go ahead, Jimmy. All right, thanks Casey for that introduction and for the invitation to talk today. Let me just get myself uh, screen shared here. Uh, how does this look and can you see me and hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. I'd like to tell you about some of this work I uh, have been a part of trying to identify a host receptor in a group of parasites called hookworm. Uh, this has been a pretty big collaboration at a number of uh, different institutions and some of this work was published recently in the International Journal for Parasitology so you could find some more details there. Um, again, I'm Jimmy Bernat. I use he, him pronouns. I'm at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and I'm also pretty active um, in science engagement on social media, so feel free to uh, give me a follow or reach out to me there. So some background on hookworm. Uh, hookworm are parasitic nematodes that infect about 500 million people around the world, predominantly in tropical and subtropical areas because the free living stages are um, not freeze resistant. Uh, people become infected when they uh, come in contact with soil contaminated with feces from infected people, and heavy infection can cause severe anemia. Heavy infection is typically considered to be hundreds or thousands of worms, which is not uncommon in areas where hookworm is endemic. And this anemia can be especially devastating in children, pregnant women, and the elderly. Really heavy infections could cause like 200 milliliters of blood loss every day because these worms do feed on blood in the intestine. Here in this map, you could see from a Nature Review article that a large portion of the worm has, uh, world has prevalence rates between like one and 20% or even 20 to 50% of people being infected in some areas. Here they show the United States as being a non-endemic area for hookworm, um, but at least historically that Sorry. is not the case. Um, in the early 1900s, you know, I'm in Washington DC right now. So just a little south of me in Virginia in the early 1900s, between five and 25% of people that were examined were infected with hookworm. I know I'm talking to the Cal Academy of Science. So I did some quick look and also California, this was the case in the early 1900s where uh, in some cases, 75% of the miners in particular gold mines were infected with hookworm, uh, largely probably because of uh, poor waste disposal. Um, the US did a pretty good job or so we thought of eradicating hookworm, but people were pretty surprised in 2011 to find that about one in three people were infected with hookworm in low income rural parts of Alabama. So areas that still have difficulty with um, waste disposal and indoor plumbing still have major challenges with hookworm even in the US. Um, so this life cycle will start up here where we can see male and female adult hookworms that live in the intestine and feed on blood. They're about a centimeter long. A single female can produce about 10,000 eggs per day. These eggs are passed with the feces and to the external environment. A number of free living state larval stages hatch and these are, and they feed on uh, bacteria in the soil and eventually molt into the third larval stage, which is the infective stage or called the IL-3. And this stage undergoes a form of developmental arrest until it encounters a permissive host. When it encounters a host, it penetrates the skin often through the feet um, and makes its way to the circulatory system, hitches a ride on the circulatory system until it gets into the lungs, it breaks out of the alveoli into the lungs, and then is either, and then needs to get to the intestine essentially. So it has a few routes. It could either be coughed up, they could crawl up the back of the throat, or they um, can just be carried by ciliary action up the, the back of the breathing way and then down the throat into the stomach and eventually into the intestine where they mature into the L4 stage and then finally into adults. Um, as a fun fact, not related to what I'm talking about today, but I was uh, experimentally infected with 50 uh, hookworm larvae as part of an experimental vaccine trial at George Washington <laughs> University around the same time that I was working on this research project, but this is totally unrelated. I just thought it's kind of fun to have firsthand experience with the parasites you're talking about. So they pipetted 50 of the infective larvae onto this piece of gauze that I wore for an hour. And you could see within 
within that hour, starting in this image here, I had like some small little marks from the larvae penetrating. That rash got worse over a few weeks, started to fade, and then kind of came back with a vengeance because of a common delayed immune response. Anyway, I kept the worms for about six months as part of the study, and then they cured me of it. The rash went away after about a month. I was totally fine, but I only had 50 worms. It's not uncommon for people to have thousands in areas where they're continually encountering the larvae in the environment. Um, so I want to tell you that hookworm has a number of unique strengths for studying parasitism. First, there's free living in parasitic stages in the same life cycle. There's some very well characterized homologous features in C. elegans, so we have a lot of kind of molecular tools that we can use to explore things in hookworm. Uh, that's even doubly so because there's reference genomes available for most hookworms that parasitize humans. And from an from the perspective of the evolution of host associations, hookworm's interesting because there's some closely related species with very uh, different host specificity. So for example, Nicator americanus is the hookworm I had. This is the most common species in, in the US. They basically only infect humans. Ankylostoma duodenale, closely related, also only infects humans. Ankylostoma caninum, we treat our dogs for this because dogs are, are infected. Although there's a few cases of people being infected with it in Australia, it's not really clear what's going on there. Um, but then Ankylostoma solanicum, again, really closely related to all of these, but that species can infect humans, dogs, cats, and even hamsters. And the work I'm going to talk about today has focused on Ankylostoma solanicum. It's basically the easiest to keep in the lab because you could grow it in hamsters. So the goal for this study was to identify potential host receptors, the molecular receptors that these hookworms use to identify when they're in an appropriate host and resume development. So we know that this host receptor is almost certainly a GPCR because these are the main family of transmembrane proteins that receive signals from the external environment. So we first wanted to examine GPCR diversity across free living and parasitic stages. We wanted to identify candidate host receptors via differential gene expression analyses, and we wanted to verify that C. elegans can be used as a surrogate to test GPCR expression location in uh, GFP promoter fusion experiments, which I'll talk a little bit about towards the end. So the methods for this study, we had a time series of Ankylostoma solanicum worms that were raised in hamsters. The early stages are pretty easy to collect because you just collect hamster feces and dilute them in charcoal until the IL-3s develop. The parasitic stages, which are L3 and onward, are harder to obtain because you have to basically dissect them from infected hamster stomachs or intestines. So altogether, we had this time series of infective larvae, free living, but the infective stage, then uh, the same stage, but in a host for 48 or 72 hours, then molts to the L4 stage, and finally the adults. Um, so in each case, we extracted RNA from multiple individuals of worms at each stage and uh, did some RNA-seq on an Illumina high-seq platform. The reads were aligned to the Ankylostoma solanicum genome. We identified the GPCRs, and then we used uh, differential gene expression analysis in DE-seq2. So the first result was that we found there's 371 GPCRs in the Ankylostoma solanicum genome, and the highest uh, GPCR richness, the, the most GPCRs expressed are at the IL-3 stage, where about 94% of those 371 GPCRs were expressed. And you can see that that richness decreases um, even just 48 hours or 72 hours after being in a host, and then there's a really marked decrease at that molt to, from the L3 to the L4 stage. Even after being in a host just for 72 hours, they have about half of the GPCR repertoire. Another way to look at these data is with a heat map here. So this is showing the expression of the 371 GPCRs across the different life cycle stages at the bottom. Uh, darker and more blue colors indicate higher expression. So again, you can see almost, you know, all of these are expressed at the IL-3 stage almost, and then the expression decreases in the later stages. Another way to visualize uh, that data is with uh, a violin plot. So this is essentially like a box and whiskers plot, except the shape of the plot, the width of the plot indicates the number of points underneath it. 
And I just wanted to show you here that GPCR expression was significantly different across almost all life cycle stages, except for the um, later L4 stages and the adults. Those differences between those were not significant, although differences between the adult male and female were significant in these earlier stages. The thing I want to draw your attention to here is that there's just some large downward shifts in expression. Uh, in the IL-3 to L-3. So this is the same stage just after being in a host for 48 hours, no molt or anything. Um, and then another uh, significant big shift from the L-3 to the L-4 stage, just following this molt at the same 72 hour time point. The next thing we wanted to do was select the GPCRs that were overexpressed, significantly higher uh, expression in the IL-3 versus these later stages based on the assumption that the host receptor is really only needed for signals to resume development at this IL-3 stage. And we had some preliminary data in hookworm and C. elegans to show that GPCRs stop being expressed after they're no longer needed, a relatively rapid drop in expression. So we found 31 differentially expressed GPCRs that belong to a unique family of GPCRs and nematodes called nematode chemoreceptors. And we believe the host receptor is a part of this GPCR family. So now we have a, a like relatively small group of 31 differentially expressed GPCRs that we could begin testing. And so what we did next was these GFP promoter fusion experiments where we took the hookworm promoter of this GPCR, attached GFP to it, and then made transgenic C. elegans to see where this promoter is expressed. And the key here is that we know the host receptor has to be in specific cells. We actually know it has to be in the neurons of the amphids. The amphids are uh, anterior sensory structures in nematodes, and these are the only sensory structures that are exposed to the external environment at the IL-3 stage when this worm receives the signal from a host. So we know the host receptor must be expressed in those neurons. So we took some GPCRs and we successful, we tried four different promoters initially, and we successfully expressed three of those in C. elegans. So in panel A, you can see a differentially expressed GPCR that was put into C. elegans, and we can see GFP in like anterior neurons, and then in these axons that stretch down the length of C. elegans. So on the right is a bright field view of that same worm. Um, and this panel here is just showing us a detailed view. So this is an, uh, a neuron with axons going down the ventral nerve cord. One of the things that's so cool about working with C. elegans, I normally don't have this level of granularity of information available. I typically work on parasitic copepods, but in C. elegans, all of the neurons have been mapped and even named. So we actually know this GPCR is expressed either in AVA, AVB, or AVD neurons. Um, unfortunately, these aren't these neurons aren't in the amphids, but we were able to see that they were this GPCR is expressed in neurons. In panel B, we also saw another GPCR expressed in neurons, but these were associated with the bulb and the gut of C. elegans, not the amphids. Um, and then in C, this was kind of like a control. It was a non-differentially expressed GPCR, and this was expressed in the muscle of the uh, pharynx in C. elegans. Um, so we didn't see any expression of these uh, three that we tried in the amphids, but that's the idea moving forward. So our goals first were to examine GPCR diversity across the stages of Ankylostoma solanicum, and we found GPCR diversity is the highest in the free-living stages. We think this is due to the more variable environment that the free-living stages have to uh, receive signals about compared to the more stable environment once they're in a host. We wanted to identify candidate host receptors via differential gene expression, and we identified 31 differentially expressed uh, nematode chemoreceptors, and then we wanted to verify that C. elegans can be used to test the uh, expression location of these GPCRs, and we saw expression of three hookworm GPCR promoters <clears throat> in C. elegans, two of which were in the neurons, suggesting that transgenic C. elegans can be a useful model for hookworm molecular biology. So moving forward, we want to test all of those 31 candidate host receptors with GFP promoter fusion and C. elegans to look for amphidial expression. This is just pretty time and labor intensive to do, creating all these transgenic worms. 
Um, and then when we find a receptor that's expressed in the amphidial neurons, the goal is to really create transgenic C. elegans that express this host receptor. This would be an extremely useful tool for studying hookworm host recognition because you wouldn't need hosts anymore. And the hardest part and the most expensive part about keeping these worms in the lab is you have to keep them alive, passing them through generations of hosts, which is pretty time intensive. So if we could get C. elegans to express this host receptor, uh, we can use them as a really useful model to study hookworm host recognition. And one of the main reasons for that is this host receptor would be a really attractive drug target. Most um, small molecule drugs on the market now actually target GPCRs already. So potentially a small molecule that could block this host receptor from binding a host ligand would stop the worm from ever recognizing it was in a permissive host and the worm would never develop. So this could be a really useful prophylactic treatment for hookworm. Um, so with that, I want to just thank all of the people that made this project possible. This was led by John Hodden at George Washington University. Some help from uh, Gabrielle Rudy, who was an undergraduate that stayed on as a master's student to work on this project. Also, the, uh, some other folks from GW, the Washington University and St. Louis Genomics Group, uh, Salisbury University, Seattle Children's Research Group, our funding sources. And again, there's more details about some of this work in the International Journal for Parasitology paper that came out last year. Um, with that, I want to thank Casey again for the invitation to speak to you all, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Jimmy. Does anybody have any questions? I was just wondering, Jimmy, how applicable do you think this will be like in trying to move forward with the other hookworm species? Do you want to um, try to expand to that or you want to focus more on actually working with the receptors yeah, that so you've identified? Yeah, good question. So we tried to do some comparative work because we did a time series as uh, in um, Ankylostoma caninum as well, but we didn't have all of the same stages in matching time points. So we actually had more free living stages of caninum. Basically, we didn't wanna to have to anesthetize dogs and dissect them to get the adult parasitic stages. So it's hard to do that same sort of experiment there. Um, we did some initial comparative work, but it's not, uh, caninum actually has a bunch more GPCRs um, and, and there might be some uh, annotation differences in the genomes. So it was a bit more challenging. We tried to vet some of these same GPCRs in the anglostoma exp uh, caninum expression, but we haven't exactly tied that all together. But there is interest in a, a pretty good data set already for trying to do a similar thing in, in caninum. Great. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to Kelly and maybe Jimmy can stick around if there are more questions afterwards. And if not, please, Jimmy, feel free to put the link for your paper in the chat so people can find that. Next, we have Dr. Kelly Spear, who is the Biodiversity Genomics Postdoctoral Fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Institute for Conservation Biology. And she is going to talk to us about host specificity modulates the effect of environment on microbial diversity in blood feeding flies. Uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time unmuting myself. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me and see the slides? Yes, yep. you look good. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I am going to talk to you today about insect microbiome. So insects uh, with narrow diets have very interesting microbiomes. When I talk about insects with narrow diets, think of things that specialize on a very narrow subset of foods. So insects that only feed on sap or insects that only feed on blood. Um, these microbiomes are uh, dominated by endosymbiotic bacteria that are maternally inherited. They're encased within a specialized organ in their host called a bacterium. And these endosymbionts provision nutrients missing from their host diet. Um, the microbiome though is also comprised of facultative bacteria that supplement nutrients not provided by endosymbionts um, contribute to host immune response upon pathogen invasion. So for example, in blood feeding insects, this means that the facultative bacteria in their microbiome can influence their competence at vectoring pathogens to their downstream hosts. Um, and 
this facultative bacteria community is generally more depauperate compared to omnivorous insects or other animals. So why is this important? Well, um, we know that emergent pathogens will likely be an increasing risk to wild mammals. And we've already seen the effects of this in bats, um, which have suffered mass mortality events due to white nose syndrome in the Northeastern United States. And we witnessed a saiga die off two years ago due to um, a bacterial infection. So understanding the way that um, microbiome variation is correlated with host health is going to be important in preventing these emergent events in the future. And one particular set of pathogens that we know very little about are arthropod vector pathogens. Um, so understanding how the microbiome influences the ability of an insect to transmit a disease to its host is going to be important for preventing um, arthropod vector pathogen emergence. So what are the hypotheses about um, where the microbiome comes from? Um, we know that endosymbionts are maternally inherited. So what is the source of the broader microbiome community, including those facultative bacteria? Well, one hypothesis is that the microbiome is colonized by a subset of environmental bacteria. Um, another hypothesis might be that the microbiome is vertically or horizontally transmitted meaning that it's passed from mother to offspring like endosymbionts or potentially inoculated from other um, insects within the same community, similar to what we see in some used social insects like ants. A third hypothesis is that both the environment and insect community contribute to the microbiome. So in order to test this, uh, I used bat flies and their bat hosts. So bat flies are obligate host specific parasites of bats. They only feed on bat blood and they generally only occupy one or two species of bats. Here are two um, specific parasite species that I studied for this project. This is Trichobius spheronotus on the top and Nycterophilia coxata on the bottom. And this is the bat uh, Leptonycterus yerba buena, which is the host of these bat flies. Um, Leptonycterus is a nectar and pollen feeding bat, and it's actually um, responsible for pollinating wild agave. So if you like tequila, then you like this bat. <laughs> um, so uh, I went into some caves where um, Leptonycterus was roosting. I swabbed those caves to characterize the microbiome there. I swabbed the skin of the bat, and I also um, collected the bat flies feeding on those swabbed bats. And I used high throughput 16S rRNA metabarcoding to characterize the microbiomes from all of these different sample types. Uh, here are my collection localities. Um, we have five cave sites spread uh, throughout Mexico. Three of them are in the Baja Peninsula, um, but two of the caves are actually just very close together. <laughs> um, and then there are these two mainland sites. Uh, I swabbed each cave multiple times, but then I pooled the swabs from a single cave into one representative microbiome library. So we essentially have five cave swabs 42 bat skin swabs and 138 bat fly microbiomes to compare uh, the relative influence of the environment and parasite uh, physiology and um, population dynamics on the uh, contribution and composition of the microbiome. So here's a qualitative look at what the microbiomes look like from these different sample types. Each bar here represents a different sample type with the bat skin swabs and the bat fly species split based on whether or not they were female or male. Uh, the colors in this plot represent different bacterial classes or genera, and the size of the different colors represents the relative abundance of those bacteria within a specific sample type. So when we look at the cave swabs, um, this is essentially an uh, aggregate of all of the cave samples, we see that it's very similar to the aggregate um, of the bat uh, skin swabs. But the bat fly microbiomes are much different from both the bat and the cave, and they're also different from each other. The bat flies are um, microbiomes are dominated by primary endosymbionts. So in Trichobia spheronotus, that primary endosymbiont is arsenophonous. Uh, this is expected. Arsenophonus is uh, expected to provision B vitamins missing from the blood meal of bat flies. And these B vitamins are necessary for the development and reproduction of bat flies. Nycterophilia coxata, on the other hand, is dominated by um, a genus specific uh, endosymbiont that has previously been described. 
One other interesting thing to note um, from this uh, bar graph is that Trichobius spironotus seems to have a much higher relative abundance of Bartonella and Wolbachia compared to Nycterophilia coxata. Uh, Bartonella is a bacterial pathogen that bat flies transmit to bats, and some members of this genus cause human disease, um, including trench fever and um, cat scratch fever. Uh, Wolbachia is a reproductive parasite of insects that can cause mitochondrial uh, DNA sweeps. So even though this is just relative abundance and you know, we should take this with a grain of salt, it's interesting that there might be a differential susceptibility between these two batfly species to Bartonella and Wolbachia, even though these batfly species are feeding on the same exact bat individuals. To take a different look at this data and examine how geographic locality might influence um, microbiome variation, I've split our sample types into these four different panels and each bar here now represents a, a sampling locality. So when we look at the two, the cave and bat panels, we can see that there's a lot of geographic variation between um, different sampling sites. And um, for example, when we look at one um, collection locality, Carmen, for example, the cave swabs are, uh, and bat skin swabs are similar between this location. However, when we look at the bat flies, we see very little geographic variation across sampling sites. Um, and again, the bat fly microbiomes are dominated by their respective primary symbionts. So to take a quantitative look at this, I constructed a principal coordinates plot. So each point here represents a microbiome community. And when two points are close together, it means that the microbiome communities are similar in their composition. When the two points are far apart, it means that they're dissimilar. So the circles here represent um, samples that were collected in Baja and the triangles represent samples that were collected on the mainland of Mexico and the different colors represent the um, sample types. Again, the cave and bat samples are almost completely overlapping here, meaning that they're very similar microbiomes. But the two bat fly species have distinct microbiome communities from their environment, the environment being the cave and the bat, and they also are distinct from each other, despite having the same exact diet. Um, when we use PERMANOVA analysis to see if sample type is a significant explanatory variable of, uh, or I'm sorry, mark, uh, yeah, if sample type is a significant explanatory variable of microbiome variation, we see that it is significant, but one of the assumptions of PERMANOVA is that if your sample sizes are uneven, the distribution of the variance in your data must be even. So homoscedasticity cannot be violated. Unfortunately, our data violates that assumption. So in order to assess the signal in this data, um, we used random forests. Random forests work well for categorical data. They're a machine learning algorithm. Um, they don't make assumptions about the underlying distribution of the data. So homoscedasticity is not as much of an issue for random forests. And while sample sizes um, being uneven can still cause issues for random forests, you can use resampling to ameliorate those issues. To apply random forest to our um, specific question, we use a variable of interest as the outcome and the microbiome as the predictor. So the way that looks in an equation form is we use sample type as our outcome variable, the principal coordinate axis one and two as our microbiome predictor variables, um, and we added collection locality to help uh, refine our model. When we, uh, so we split our data into a test um, a test set, a validation set, and I'm sorry, a training set, a validation set, and separately a test set. And when we ran that test set of data um, through our model to see how accurate our random forests were at accurately characterizing the sample type um, of our data, the model was extremely accurate. And the only time that it mischaracterized a microbiome sample type was between bat skin and cave swabs. So what does this information tell us? Well, bat fly microbiomes are more conserved than expected. Um, bat flies feeding on the same exact bat individuals have distinct microbiome communities. Um, there's potentially different susceptibility to Bartonella and Wolbachia between bat fly species, possibly related to the interaction of these um, pathogenic 
bacteria with the primary endosymbionts of these uh, different species of bat fly. And there's strong geographic variation in bat skin microbiomes and cave microbiomes despite high annual movement between these sites. So taken together, this means, this tells us that the environment may play less of an important role in explaining microbiome variation in bat flies. So if we're trying to understand how um, pathogens of bats like Bartonella might be influenced by the microbiome in bat flies, it's more important than the bat fly physiology than um, geographic variation. Um, but uh, geographic variation may not characterize the entire suite of environmental factors that might influence the microbiome. Um, so yeah, with that, I can take any questions. Thanks, Kelly. Does anybody have any questions? I'll go ahead and start and see if anybody else comes up with something. Um, Kelly, do you see many differences in abundances between the two different bat fly species? Like, do you think, do you have reason to believe that maybe one microbiome or something may also be playing a role in making one bat fly or some other factor making one species of bat fly more successful than the other? Um, by more successful, you mean in terms of fitness or in terms of vector competence? In terms of fitness, uh, it's actually just being a better parasite. Do you see different, mostly do you see differences in abundances between the two mm, I see. species um, of parasites? So uh, I haven't actually collected data to analyze that question, but just anecdotally, um, actually, yes, there are different abundances of these two different parasite species on um, bats. Um, the unfortunate thing, as I'm, you, you know, uh, uh, this is true about most parasites, is um, sampling bias is strongly influences the data we have to characterize the abundance of parasites and their location in a host. So Nycterophilia coxata is um, what is known as a swimming bat fly. So it actually runs through the fur and it's extremely difficult to sample and catch. And so anytime that you read about these, this genus of bat flies, they are always, almost always um, at lower representation than other bat flies that kind of crawl across the top of the fur. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to estimate their abundance. But yeah, um, just anecdotally, um, nycterophilia is very common um, on these bats and much more common um, in terms of prevalence, at least, um, than Trachobius spironotis, but the sample size are often much smaller. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, then I'll ask another one. Do you think, Kelly, that, so it looks like you found um, high seasonal or temporal turnover in the bat skin swabs and potentially even the cave swabs? And do you expect that this bat skin swabs might change with different parts of the body or are you, you feel like you're getting a really good measure of the microbiomes of bats when you do your swabs? Well, um, so we, uh, we specifically sampled only the um, dorsal section of the bat skin, but we sampled the entire dorsum um, of the, uh, sorry, of the furred part. We didn't actually sample the wings. Um, so it's possible that there is different um, variation uh, if we sample the different portion of the bat. But when I constructed, um, uh, I, I used um, oh gosh, uh, plots to determine whether or not increasing our sample size would increase uh, or increasing our sequencing depth would increase the number of bacteria that we detected in our bat skin samples but we saw a plateau in those plots. And so it doesn't appear that we're missing bacteria on the dorsum of the bat. Um, in terms of seasonal variation, that's unfortunately a confounding variable in this data set. Um, because Leptonycterus yerbibuinae is migratory between these caves, there are large um, par portions of the year where you just cannot find those bats at a given cave. And so we aren't able to control for the seasonal variation associated with this data. Um, we sort of sacrificed um, being able to say that there was high dispersal between these sites um, and being unable to explain the seasonality aspect. All right, thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Let's go ahead and have our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Erica Taylor-Ebbs. 
She is an assistant professor of biology at Purchase College SUNY, and she is going to be talking about illuminating schistosome diversity, phylogenomics, and diversification of schistosomiae using targeted sequence. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. So thank you for being here and thank you, Casey, for inviting me to be here. Um, okay, so I one of the kind of main questions that's always <clears throat> fascinated, fascinated me about parasitology is how do host traits impact parasite evolution? So the parasites that I specifically work with are multi-host parasites, uh, parasitic worms, uh, schistosomes, that utilize two hosts in their life cycle. And so these two hosts are very different taxonomically and ecologically, um, but their traits are inseparable from the parasite themselves. And so most of you can just kind of immediately come up with a list of host traits that likely or potentially influence parasite evolution. And these can be things like host immunology, host genetics, host ecology. Um, and it's likely that all of these things kind of in aggregate or in a relative sense are influencing or contributing to parasite evolution at both the microevolutionary level and the macroevolutionary level. But to begin to get at these bigger questions, uh, you have to have a evolutionary framework that's resolved um, to be able to start addressing these hypotheses. And so my research focuses specifically on one group of trematodes, the schistosomes. Uh, they are trematodes within the family schistosomatidae. And I um, am interested in, pair, in uh, schistosome diversity and schistosome interrelationships. And so there's a few reasons why schistosomes make really good models for these kinds of questions or thinking about the evolution of host traits. So as adults, these worms infect uh, birds. They're, uh, they're parasites of birds and mammals. So you see the adults in uh, the vertebrate definitive host, and they actually live in the venous system of their host. So they live in this really hostile, immunologically uh, intense environment. Uh, and then the, uh, the parasites pass their eggs in the feces of the host. And they, uh, hopefully for the, from the parasite's perspective, will end up in an aquatic environment. Uh, larvae will hatch out from the egg and then penetrate a snail intermediate host. And within the snail intermediate host, asexual amplification will occur. And uh, many copies of a second larval stage known as a saccharia will come out of the snail and will seek out the definitive host to, uh, to infect. And so the saccharia will directly penetrate the, the uh, vertebrate host skin. And uh, one of the uh, other really beneficial things about working with schistosomes is that they have a two host life cycle which is a kind of reduced trait. Um, most trematodes have a three to four host life cycle. So the fact that schistosomes have this kind of simpler life cycle makes them more tractable for these evolutionary studies. So additionally, we know a lot about schistosome biology uh, because there are several species that are specific to uh, humans. So there's a group of human schistosomes that uh, utilize humans as their definitive host, and they cause the disease human schistosomiasis. Additionally, the other species, those that do not affect humans, but infect wildlife, also causes zoonotic disease known as human circarial dermatitis, um, also known as swimmer's itch. And so due to their relevance to human health, they've been studied as a group for a while. And we know a lot about them taxonom taxonomically and in terms of their host parasite associations. And so taxonomically, there are 14 named genera and uh, about 110 named species. We know from our collection uh, efforts that these are pretty significant underestimates, uh, particularly among the avian infecting lineages. There are 
eight mammalian orders that have been known to host schistosomes and 10 avian orders. Uh, so you can see schistosomes in everything from an elephant to a hippopotamus to a human to a duck or a seagull or a passerine bird. So there's a wide range of birds and mammals that can host these worms. But even more remarkably, there are 16 different snail families that host uh, schistosomes, which generally uh, trematode families, uh, different families other than schistosomatidae, are specific to one or two families of snails. So 16 different families within a single trematode group is pretty uh, remarkable. And so these snails in, are, can be found in both freshwater and marine environments. And it seems to suggest that there's over the evolutionary history of schistosomes that there's been this rampant intermediate host switching. And so the data, the samples that I'm going to be presenting today are all museum specimens uh, that were collected specifically for the purpose of understanding and inventorying schistosome diversity globally. Uh, these samples were not necessarily collected with the intention of doing phylogenomic research. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that shortly. But so we have, uh, we in the collective sense, uh, have been working on amassing this schistosome data set over the last 30 years. I obviously, this data set predates my involvement in the project. Um, but we have amassed the largest and most taxon rich collection of schistosomes from around the world. And all of these samples are housed at the Museum of Southwestern Biology at the Parasite Collection. We have the third largest parasite collection in the world, um, and it's a very active and growing collection. And so just uh, you know, a note about the sample, those of you that work with museum specimens, this is something I'm sure you're all kind of can sympathize with. Uh, the many of these samples are, you know, one fragment of a worm that was collected from one host at one time, one locality from one part of the world. Um, so they're to say they're kind of priceless or precious samples is an understatement. So um, I'll be talking about that more when we talk about the kind of uh, the DNA extractions. Um, but so yes, so our sampling covers the global range of, of schistosomes. And so what we have amassed is this great uh, natural history data set with great taxonomic representation of schistosomes, but we still lack this robust evolutionary framework to put all of this in and to try and make sense of these traits. And so there has been a long standing effort to try and resolve the schistosomatidae family tree. And this began in 2000 uh, with the first uh, molecular phylogeny of schistosomatidae. And so this phylogeny was based on a single loci as was common during that time. And, uh, but it included the majority or really all of the major schistosome groups that we still identify today as being the main clades. And so taxonomically, it was a very well, uh, well um, set up study. And so just to walk you through some of these. So the, uh, what this initial study in 2000 found was that there was a single kind of large mammalian clade that the majority of mammalian schistosomes fell in. Um, and this included all of the Asian and African uh, mammalian schistosomes, including those that infect humans. There was a marine avian clade that uh, included two globally distributed genera that infected primarily seagulls. Um, in marine environments, a second uh, mammalian group that was restricted to North America, um, and including two monotypic genera that were only found in North American mammals. And then lastly, what we refer to as the derived avian schistosome clade. This is kind of the uh, where everything else falls. The majority of schistosome diversity in terms of species richness falls in this group. 
And so 20 years later, basically, from the publication of, of that paper, uh, the tax on sampling has increased uh, pretty substantially, and specifically in the derived avian schistosome clade. This is just a, a small snapshot of that diversity. Not everything is included in this tree. Um, but uh, specifically within this large avian schistosome clade, we see uh, a huge exponential growth in uh, taxon sampling. But we've also have found other avian infecting lineages that fall outside of this clade, uh, like macroblharzia, we have acquired uh, good genetic data for, as well as some other mammalian schistosome clades as well. And, uh, but while we have this great increased sampling, we still lack resolution at the, at the deeper nodes in our tree. And so this lack of resolution really limits our understanding of schistosome evolution. And it inhibits us from being able to think about or generate hypotheses uh, for host switching, biogeography, and uh, the timing of diversification of these worms. And so there's a clear need for improved phylogenetic markers. And so to address that need, we have developed a sequence, we performed sequence capture to develop UCE loci, which are ultra conserved ele elements. These are highly conserved regions in the genome uh, of schistosomes. So we designed probes specifically to target these highly conserved uh, loci within schistosomatidae and then perform target enrichment to get uh, to sequence these loci using an Illumina platform. And so the, the two main benefits of using taking the UCE route to get uh, phylogenetic markers for schistosomes was one that it's a reproducible method. So we make this probe set and then we can apply those probes to samples we could collect down the road. Um, so we're always gonna be able to sample the same loci and, and reproduce and expand this data set. Uh, additionally, our sampling strategy was to break up our samples into multiple runs. So we, uh, we had this balance of trying to minimize the amount of tissue being used um, and then to optimize our capture protocols to be able to uh, get the most loci recovered. And so uh, the capture protocols were optimized across or over additional runs. And so being re having a reproducible method was really important. And UCEs, for the most part, sol solve our host contamination issues. Um, just as an aside, we, uh, we have tried a whole genome approaches for the avian schistosomes, and we ran into quite a few problems. Um, the, the worms themselves are essentially eating nucleated blood cells. And so when we would uh, run, do a, a genome run, we would get 90% of the reads back would be uh, avian in origin. And so the UCs are very targeted. We're only looking at a set of loci that only occur in schistosomatidae um, or in trematodes at least. And so these are, this is a really good approach for systems with limited genomic resource. And so we are fortunate in that we do have good genomic resources for some schistosome species, namely the human schistosomes, uh, where we have mostly assembled human uh, genomes for three of the human species. And so from the, from the schistosoma genomes, we designed a bait set to target about uh, 2200 loci. And we performed sequence capture of 98 schistosome samples. And then we also mined published genomes of schistosoma and trichobaharzia, uh, which, is an, which is an avian infecting uh, lineage. And in total, we ended up with 126 samples for which we had UCE data. Uh, so putting this in the context of the named genera, we sampled 13 of the 14 named genera. 
Uh, the only one we were not able to get was a, a genus that was described once and no one has seen for 40 years. Um, and then uh, several unnamed lineages or newly discovered lineages. And so just to reiterate, you know, these samples were not collected with phylogenomics in mind. Um, so they were collected over different life stages over a 30 year period uh, with different preservation protocols. And so many of them, I would say most of them were highly degraded. And so that was kind of a persistent uh, issue. Um, and additionally, often when you collect schistosomes, uh, th these are images of the different adult forms um, or two of the different adult forms, um, they are very small worms. So this image here of Alabaharzia is kind of a common avian it's just its own body plan where they're thread-like worms and they live in the mesenteric veins of the host. And so they're very small and it's almost impossible to get a whole worm out. So usually what you end up with is a very small fragment. So your starting tissue is very small. And so as those of you that are familiar with NGS know, having a good amount of starting DNA is ideal. Um, and we almost never had that with these worms, which is a common problem in parasite genomics for many parasite systems. Um, so what we, we see there's a relationship obviously between the amount of DNA you get in your starting tissue and that that DNA also relates to the number of UCE loci that you can recover. Um, and this was the, the tissue issue was also especially true when we were working with Sicaria where we only had a few, a few individuals. And so this is just a uh, kind of subset of the summary data from our sequ sequence capture, um, just to give you an idea of how some of these values ranged. So it's recommended uh, for our NGS that you're starting with at least one microgram of DNA. Often we were starting with five to 25% of the recommended amount. Often we were starting below the recommended amount, almost always, and then rarely were we above that. Um, there were some samples you can see where we, we were higher um, and we got really good results, but often we were still able to get re good results with you know, less than half of the recommended value. Um, so so that, is, that was a positive finding. So the range of UCE loci that we found so, or that we recovered were from basically zero to about 1900. So it was a big range. A lot of the samples just outright failed, but a lot performed really well, despite having really degraded samples and having limited starting DNA. Um, we just kind of at face value removed all samples that had fewer than 500 loci. And so then the remaining loci were concatenated into a super matrix and analyzed using maximum likelihood methods in RaxML. Uh, and so the super matrix was able to accommodate a certain amount of missing data, essentially the percentage of taxa missing per loci. And so what we ended up making were basically a set of different alignments that accommodated a different amount of missing data. So there were very few loci, um, less than 10, that were shared by all taxa. Um, so that we uh, analyzed, it, analyzed almost no 100% uh, you know, complete uh, data sets. So I'm gonna choose to show you the 73% uh, complete data set. Um, when we allow, um, missing more missing data than this 30% cutoff, we start seeing um, our confidence values drop and issues with the topology. So this uh, data set included 756 loci, which is quite a bit uh, more than what we were working with before, uh, which was primarily two to three loci. Um, and so what we ended up finding in some ways reaffirmed the initial expectations from the 2000 paper, the first, you know, attempt at a molecular phylogeny versus somatidae. 
And then some other things, uh, some other findings switch things up a bit. So one is that we, uh, we found strong support for a basal marine avian clade. So that the basal, uh, the basal group in Schistosomatidae, um, we have strong support with our UCE data as well as some more recent molecular data um, not related to this data set support that uh, these two avian lineages fall uh, at the base of the tree. And so that schistosomes originated in birds in a marine environment. And then our data supports what was uh, suggested by the 2000 paper that mammalian schistosomes are not monophyletic. There's two uh, separate clades indicating there's been two independent host switching events from birds into mammals. And so uh, our data also supports that these North American schistosomes are actually basal to the uh, derived avian schistosome group. Uh, where the majority of schistosome diversity falls, taxonomic diversity falls. So the UCE data also supports, as is expected from all of our single loci data, that there's been major radiation in avian hosts uh, globally. So we have expanded significantly the number of genera to be included in this, um, in this phylogenomics data set. And we find uh, here they're not labeled by geography, but these genera you know, have been recovered from all over the world, different snail intermediate host families, um, predominantly though in waterfowl. So waterfowl seem to be kind of the major group that schistosomes have radiated in. And then lastly, we found uh, support for the placement of macrobalharzia. So this is a genus of schistosome that has always been a little bit mysterious, not that much is known about it. Um, and it's phylogenetic affinity in all of the single loci uh, phylogenies kind of flops around and it doesn't really have a, a place where it wants to land. And so we find some support that it is uh, more closely related to the mammalian schistosomes, the old world mammalian schistosomes, than it is to uh, the derived avian schistosomes. So to clarify macrobalharzia, as far as we know, they all go through birds. Erica, I'm going to go ahead and sorry, stop you. We are running out of time and I oh, just want to make sorry. sure we have enough time yeah, for the sorry, other speakers. Um, thank you for that. And um, maybe at the end, we'll have enough time to have a few questions. That sounds Thanks. great. Let me stop sharing. All right. Up next, we have Dr. Drew Sweet, who is an assistant professor of biology at Arkansas State University. And he's going to be talking about the grouse louse using genomic data to understand <laughs> to understand relationships between Alaskan ptarmigan and their feather lice. All right. Thanks, Casey. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, and, and thank you for yeah, to Casey for organizing the session and um, for inviting me to um, be a, a part of, of this. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some work um, that my colleagues and I have done on Alaskan ptarmigan and their lice. Um, but before we dive into that, I want to take a quick step back and talk about host parasite interactions more generally. Um, so you might have an individual organism or a group of organisms, um, and this might be host to several different types of internal um, and external parasites. Um, but when we're thinking about, at least from an evolutionary perspective, trying to compare um, within the system, so trying to untangle the evolutionary interactions that are going on here, um, it can be quite challenging because as we've already heard um, through some of the talks today, there can be quite a variation in the life histories and ecologies of, of different um, parasites, even on a single group of hosts. So for example, you might have um, a type of parasite that is free living during some of its life stage um, or another parasite that um, has different life stages associated with different host species. And then, and then you might have parasites um, that are more permanent. So spending their entire life on a single host. Um, so one way to kind of simplify things to help look at these kind of evolutionary comparisons um, is to look at what are called ecologically replicate lineages. And what I mean by this 
um, are comparing two or more um, groups of similar parasites, so similar in terms of their life history or even in, in their ecology, um, that are on the same group of hosts. Um, so even though if there might be differences between, um, between them, um, you're, you're kind of laying a baseline and, and controlling for a lot of, of, of um, other factors that might be going on. And um, you can do these kind of comparisons among different replicate parasite lineages at different evolutionary scales. And it can be really informative for understanding um, sort of these evolutionary patterns that are happening um, at sort of deeper and, and more shallow evolutionary scales. So as an example, at kind of a, one of those deeper phylogenetic scales, um, this is a, a classic study on fig wasps and, and figs. So you have two different types of, of fig wasps that are associated with the same same genus of fig, um, ficus, um, and due to their differences in ecology, they have very different um, long-term evolutionary patterns. And then this comes out in, in the comparison. Um, you can do the same thing at a population scale. So in, in this study by de Blasi et al., um, they were able to look at two different types of, of lice from pigeons. Um, and they found that the body lice had more, more population genetic structure compared to wing lice, um, suggesting that there were dispersal differences driving um, these relationships. Um, you know, and as we, as we move into the genomic era, these comparisons become even more powerful as we get increased resolution at both phylogenetic and population genetic scales. And so um, for the talk today, I, I really want to talk to you about two different applications for using genomic data um, with these, these replicate parasite lineages. It's not exhaustive, um, but I think there's two, two areas that it's particularly useful for in understanding host parasite evolution and, and co-evolution. And the first is to clarify those long-term evolutionary or co-evolutionary patterns, depending on how you want to define co-evolution um, in a single host parasite system. So again, looking um, at a more complex system over longer periods of time. And then second, a more population focused question and looking at can the parasites give us insight into connectivity between different host populations. So using, using the parasites essentially as a marker to understand um, host demographics. So to address these two questions, I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing in ptarmigan and their, their feather lice. And I want to pause here and, and really um, highlight Sarah Sonsagen and Rob Wilson, um, two of my co-authors on this, on this study. They really initiated and, and designed the initial study and collected um, most, if not all, of the samples and, and a lot of the genetic data. Um, so this, this work is, is theirs as much as it is mine. So uh, ptarmigan, they're, they're a type of grouse, this kind of um, game bird, and there's three different species of ptarmigan. Um, there's all in the same genus, Lagopus. So two of, the, two of the species, the willow and the rock ptarmigan here, they have this broad kind of circumpolar distribution in both North America and Eurasia, um, whereas the third species, the white-tailed ptarmigan, only has a North American distribution. Um, and from a phylogenetic standpoint, um, you can see here are the ptarmigan here in this green box here, um, among other, other species of grouse, this phylogeny from persons et al. Um, and I think what's most important to take away from this is sort of a biogeographic um, story here that even though two of the species of ptarmigan have this global distribution in both Eurasia and North America, um, the genus as a whole has a North American origin. And there's, there's a lot of evidence that, that ptarmigan have actually moved back and forth um, between North America and Eurasia several times. So even though this bird is not a long distance migrant and doesn't really do much um, long distance dispersal, um, there, there is evidence even from their ecology that there's this seasonal and local movements that are going on. Going on. Um, and this is important for, for later on, so, so remember, remember that. So on the parasite side of things, ptarmigan and, and grouse as a whole, they have two different genera of lice. So here we have our, our replicate system, um, two different similar parasites on, on the same group of hosts. Um, so the first genus is Lagopoecus and the second is Gonioides. Um, like most feather lice, these insects are permanent and obligate ectoparasites. So they're spending their entire life cycle on the host and they're not surviving for very long if, if for some reason they, they get knocked off of the host. Um, they're feeding on feathers and skin, um, and it's important to note that they're primarily transmitted vertically, um, so between um, parents and offspring, but there's also horizontal transfer that, that can go on um, between different ptarmigan or grouse individuals. 
And this usually is happening through host contact or shared space, so shared um, nesting areas or feeding areas. Um, but the key point there is that there really needs to be um, proximity of, of hosts in order for this, for this transfer to happen. So with this system in mind, kind of going back to those two overarching goals of what I want to talk to you about, um, using ptarmigans and their lice, I want to first look at kind of a phylogenetic perspective to clarify these long-term coevolutionary patterns. And then secondly, take a more population genetics approach and look at how the, the, what the lice can tell us about connectivity between ptarmigan populations. Um, so to, to get our sampling for this, uh, we were able to get both Lagopoecus and Gonioides, so both genera of lice um, from all three ptarmigan species. Um, and then we also sampled lice from five, five other um, North American grouse species. So we can get kind of that broader, broader phylogenetic scale. But then of course, you know, I mentioned we're also interested in, in these population level questions. And so local sampling is also very important here. Um, and to do this, we targeted the willow and the rock ptarmigan. Um, they're, they're widespread throughout the state of Alaska, as you can see on these, on these maps here. Um, and so we were able to get a population level sampling of both genera of lice, both genus, both genera of lice from willow and rock ptarmigans um, in four different populations. Okay, so four different populations of um, samples from, of the birds and then of both, both um, louse taxa. So then, you know, we're using this genomic approach. And so to, to get our sequence data, we, we did whole genome sequencing of individual lice. And fortunately, lice have fairly small nuclear genomes. And so we were able to do sort of a low pass approach um, to get data that we could use for both phylogenetic and population genetic analyses. Um, so using a combination of tar targeted de novo assembly um, and then read mapping. Okay, so um, first let me, show you some of the results that we got from, from, from a phylogenetic perspective. Um, so to do this, we could take our assembled genes. In this case, we had over, a, over or around a thousand, a thousand nuclear genes um, for the lice um, and use these to estimate um, a well-supported phylogeny um, and then test for operational taxon taxonomic units or OTUs, essentially looking for cryptic species or cryptic diversity. And then we can use this essentially species tree of, of the parasite and compare it to, to the host phylogeny to, to get kind of that, that coevolutionary perspective. So I'm gonna show you the results um, for each genus of Laos separately, okay? So first we'll look at Gonioides. Um, and if you haven't seen one of these figures before, this is called a tanglegram. Um, and so you have the host phylogeny over here on the left. And this is that same phylogeny you saw earlier from Persons et al. And then over on the right is the parasite phylogeny. Um, and then we have what are called co-divergence events. So kind of the strict, strict co-divergence in these circles. And then host switches are these, these dotted arrows here. Um, okay, so what was I able to find with gonioides? Well, first of all, we had a very well-supported phylogeny. Um, so all of these had, had bootstrap supports around 100%. Um, we found that there were two species of, tarmi of, of lice associated with the ptarmigan. So they're highlighted in the green, green boxes here. And I think the most important takeaway here is to note that the origin um, of, this, of this clade, at least, of gonioides seemed to originate in other species of grouse. So highlighted with this, this box here with the yellow co-divergence event. And then there was a subsequent host switch to ptarmigan, okay? And um, that's important because when we look at the other genus, so this is that other genus of Lagopoecus, we see a kind of a different story. And so once again, a very well-supported tree. Um, and there were, we found three different species of Lagopoecus that were associated with ptarmigan. Um, there's a lot more host switching going on in this genus. And we have, here's that other story that I was telling you about. And so the origin is actually in ptarmigan. So we have kind of the opposite thing going on in Lagopoecus. So origin in ptarmigan and then subsequent host switches um, to other species of grouse. So this really highlights that you can have really highly variable host parasite relationships over long periods of evolutionary time, even within similar or between similar groups of parasites on a single group of hosts. And this, you know, this comes out due to our, our comparisons, looking at multiple types of parasites on a single group of hosts. Okay, um, so the second thing I wanted to talk to you about was, was looking at the population genetic patterns 
and particularly asking this question about um, host population connectivity. Um, and if you remember, we, we had this workflow um, for, for obtaining genomic level data for the lice um, highlighted here in red. So we were able to get, um, get loci for population genetic analysis. Um, and then from those willow and rock ptarmigan, again, those widespread um, species of ptarmigan, um, we were able to get lots of, of SNPs using DDRAD-seq. And so here's just an, an overview of, of some of the data we were able to get. Um, so thousands of SNPs for the birds and their lice, um, a little bit of a low sample size um, with, with nine samples of, of, of birds, uh, but hopefully enough to, to begin to see um, some, some population genetic structure. And it, it's really important to note here that the lice that we use for these, for these um, analyses were from the same host individuals. Um, so the host individuals that we analyzed for population genetic structure um, mirrored those or they matched um, where the, the lice came from, which is not always the case. Um, the, the lice weren't just representatives from, from particular host populations. Um, so I'm going to show you the results on uh, PCA plots or principal component plots. Um, and so that the individual dots here represent individual birds or lice. And so looking at the hosts first, so the willow and the rock ptarmigan, um, we do see that there's some population structure in both groups, both groups of birds. And I'll particularly highlight this population here in, in the rock ptarmigan it seems to be driving um, a lot of the structure that we see. So there's significant isolation by distance in both of these, these groups. Um, and this population is, is found down here in the south, southeast of the state. But when we look at the parasites, so the, the lice, um, both in Gonioides and in Lagopuicus, so both genera, um, there really isn't any significant structure um, that, we can, that we can ascertain from these samples. Um, and so this suggests that there is um, these connections among host populations. So even though the populations of looking at the birds themselves, there seems to be some separation. Um, when you look at the, at the parasites, it seems that there's a lot of, of contact happening <laughs> between the different populations, um, which is consistent with what we know about the ecology of these birds, that there, there seems to be this, this seasonal movement um, that happens at least at a local level. Um, but you know, the, the last thing I want to point out here is that we can also see some indication of fine scale movement among host populations using information from, um, from their parasites. So I'm going to show you um, this, these results are from admixture plots. So it's using the same data. Um, it's, it's essentially showing you the same kind of structure, but just in, in a different way. Um, and I want to particularly highlight this population here. So this is that same population in Southeast Alaska. And you notice in the birds, um, there's really no evidence of admixture between other populations. Whereas if you look at the lice in both Gonioides and Lagopuicus, um, there's a single individual in each genus that seems to have um, evidence of admixed ancestry. Um, and so even, even within a very close-knit population, these individual birds are probably closely related, so either, either siblings or cousins. Um, and so we see variation in, in the structure, even within a family. Um, and there's evidence for gene flow, even between the Southeast population and this Arctic population that's, that's you know, miles and miles away. And so even though we couldn't see this, this structure in the hosts, again, there, there's really no evidence of, of, of admixed ancestry in this population um, from these samples. We were able to ascertain this structure from the, from the population, from the population structure of the parasites. Okay, um, so just to conclude again, you know, thinking about the system from both a phylogenetic and, and population genetic perspective, um, we were able to find that there's this variable host parasite coevolutionary patterns, even within a single group of, of similar parasites. Um, and then we were able to get some really great insights into the connectivity between different host populations, um, even at a very fine scale. So I will, um, conclude. And again, I'd like to, to acknowledge Sarah Sonsagen and Rob Wilson, um, as well as those who provided samples, and Rebecca Kimball for providing the phylogeny of, of grouse, as well as our funding sources. Um, and I will leave it on this conclusion slide um, with some of my contact information if you'd like to get in touch. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions before